So in this video, I'm going to try to give an overview of semiconductor physics. And I'm going to be talking about, for electrical engineers at least, the central questions in semiconductor physics. Uh, the first of which is how many charge carriers do I have? So if I've got a certain piece of semiconductor, so maybe it's silicon, maybe it's some other more interesting one. Let's say it's silicon. We want to know within this block, uh, how many charge carriers, uh, so electrons are an example of a charge carrier, how many of these uh, do I have available to conduct current? So if I just had a, a metal, We know that the number of electrons available to conduct current in the metal is roughly equal to the number of atoms. Uh, but in semiconductors, that's not the case. And the reasons for that will become, will become clear as we go through the, through the course. So this is the central, one of the central questions in semiconductor physics. Uh, the second question is, where are they? And how are they moving? So if I've got uh, if I've got the same semiconductors above, say I've got some silicon with some electrons floating around, uh, and say I want to apply an external electric field, I want to know how these charges or how these charge carriers are going to respond to that. I want to know how the charge concentration is going to change within the semiconductor. What are other effects that I have to worry about? Um, and how how is this all going to play out in time? And lastly, sort of the underlying question of both of these is, how can I change these? And more than that, how can I make useful things out of them? So we're engineers, we're interested in primarily the practical applications of uh, any physics or mathematics that we learn. And so we're going to learn about in the later parts of these, these videos and in semiconductor physics in general, how you analyze things like MOSFETs, uh, diodes, uh, BJTs, uh, among other things. So these are just the Semiconductor physics is the starting point for analyzing all of these. So up next, I'm going to give a little I'm going to give a little roadmap. Uh, so what's our what's what's this adventure going to look like? Where are we going to start? So as you may have guessed, we're going to start with quantum mechanics because everything starts with quantum mechanics, <laughs> and to a lesser extent, uh, statistical mechanics or stat mech. Um, and then with these tools, which are probably the most powerful tools uh, we have at our disposal, uh, including, uh, in addition to the conservation laws, kind of sitting over here on the side, those are sort of an ever-present force in anything you do in physics. So along with, with these two tools, we're going to analyze semiconductors. And in order to do that, we're going to calculate things called uh, the density of states. So electrons, uh, how many states do they have to occupy within the semiconductor? And this is a quantum effect. Uh, basically, how much room is there for electrons? Um, we're going to derive something called the energy momentum. And that's a K, but K is a stand-in for momentum uh, band diagram. And we're going to use these, uh, and we're going to use band diagrams very heavily in semiconductor physics. If you understand by band diagrams, you understand almost everything there is uh, to understand about, um, about semiconductor physics. And we're going to use these band diagrams to calculate uh, things like the effective mass. So 
As you might imagine, applying an electric field to a charge within a semiconductor is a little more complicated than just applying it to a charge in free space. So if I've got a, an electron and I apply an electric field to it, uh, we want to know uh, what is its effective mass within a semiconductor. So if it's within a piece of silicon. Uh, in other words, how do we easily relate uh, what we know about how charges move in free space to how they move in silicon? And then uh, the last thing we're going to go over is uh, what's, what are called Fermi statistics. And these are closely tied to the density of states. Uh, and we're going to use all of these things. So the band diagrams, density of states, and Fermi statistics to answer the question, how many or how many charge carriers do I have? And we're going to do that with an, uh, with an integral, basically. So we're going to integrate uh, the density of states multiplied by our Fermi statistics over our energy band diagram. So all this is sort of brought together uh, in order to answer our first question of how many are there. So you might ask, oh, why have I been using the term charge carriers? Seems like an awfully complicated uh, term for electron. But in fact, in semiconductors, in addition to having the electron, we have what's called the hole, uh, which just acts like a positively charged electron. And I'll have a video on this later, but just to give you a, a sense of what's to come and to give you, uh, to prepare you for this rather uh, bizarre, uh, bizarre concept. And so that is all to answer our question of how many. So how many charge carriers are there in the semiconductor? The second question we want to ask is uh, where are they and how do they move? Uh, and in order to answer these questions, we're basically going to start with uh, Maxwell's equations and probability theory. And uh, don't worry too much if you're not super comfortable with these, because these are just sort of just the underlying fundamentals. Uh, we're not going to heavily use, use them other than in derivations. And we're going to use these things to figure out how, our car how do carriers move in semiconductors. And the main mechanisms are called drift and diffusion. And so we're going to go over both of these. And as you might guess, uh, one is sort of a slow motion along. The other one is uh, has to do with concentration gradients and how things diffuse. And we're also going to go over uh, carrier generation and recombination. In other words, uh, carriers aren't just sitting there. They're constantly being created and destroyed. And if we're interested in knowing how things vary with time, that it's, then it's important to understand this. And uh, interestingly, uh, if, if you understand carrier drift, that leads directly to Ohm's law. So this is actually where Ohm's law comes from. And when I first took this class, this was probably one of the cooler things that I found out of it. It's like, oh, that's, that, that's, that's the bridge between circuit theory and semiconductor physics. And we're going to use all of these mechanisms after learning about them to derive what's called the continuity equation and the ambipolar transport equation. And both of these things uh, are nothing but uh, a massive hammer. So they're just a differential equation sledgehammer that we're going to use for various semiconductor problems. And we're going to use that, uh, that sledgehammer, essentially, to, and you, you'll see why, why I call it that. It's rather complicated. Uh, we're going to use that to analyze PN junctions. Uh, once we analyze PN junctions, we'll be able to understand things like diodes, which often are just PN junctions, uh, things like MOSFETs and BJTs which collectively uh, are known as transistors. There's other kinds of transistors as well, but these are, these are two, of the, two of the big ones. We'll also be able to understand optical devices, 
So things like solar cells and photodiodes and LEDs, uh, how do these things work and how do we use them? So I hope, I hope you found this video interesting. It's sort of an overview of semiconductor physics, where we're going to go with it. If you didn't understand anything in this video, most things in this video, you're not expected to, uh, don't worry. We'll be going over them one by one, but this is sort of just uh, to give you, give you a flavor for what's to come. And at the very end, uh, this is probably gonna be the latter half of all the videos I end up making, um, is the analysis and uh, figuring out how to make these devices. And this is sort of the, the culmination of semiconductor physics is, okay, how do we actually understand uh, transistors, diodes, optical devices, and how do we use them? And how do we apply our fundamental physics to, to fundamentally understand them? So in the next video, I'm going to be talking about uh, the very first topic, and that's going to be quantum mechanics.